This is the 16th and second last lesson in the series of online lessons for the novel To Kill a Mockingbird. These lessons were created for the students of St. Patrick's CVC in Kimberley, South Africa, in preparation for their Grade 10 final examinations within the Independent Examinations Board curriculum. If you find these online lessons on the novel useful, please subscribe to the channel, like the videos, and share them with friends and colleagues. You'll need your copy of the novel for this lesson. We'll start from page 254 in the Heinemann Schools edition. Pay attention to the plot structure of these two chapters. All of the previous actions and events are coming to a head here, and we'll realize that the author, Harper Lee, has been leading us to this point since the very first page of the novel. You'll remember that the novel started with this sentence. When he was nearly 13, my brother Jem got his arm badly broken at the elbow. These chapters will tell us how Jem broke his arm. Let's get right into the reading, chapter 28 on page 254. Things did settle down after a fashion as Atticus said they would. By the middle of October, only two small things out of the ordinary happened to two Maycomb citizens. No, there were three things, and they didn't directly concern us, the Finches, but in a way they did. The first thing was that Mr. Bob Ewell acquired and lost a job in a matter of days and probably made himself unique in the annals of the 1930s. He was the only man I ever heard of who was fired from the WPA for laziness. The second thing happened to Judge Taylor. Judge Taylor was not a Sunday night churchgoer. Mrs. Taylor was. Judge Taylor savoured his Sunday night hour alone in his big house and church time found him holed up in his study reading. One Sunday night, lost in fruity metaphors and florid diction, Judge Taylor's attention was wrenched from the page by an irritating scratching noise. Hush, he said to Anne Taylor, his fat, nondescript dog. Then he realised he was speaking to an empty room. The scratching noise was coming from the rear of the house. Judge Taylor clumped to the back porch to let Anne out and found the screen door swinging open. A shadow on the corner of the house caught his eye, and that was all he saw of his visitor. Mrs. Taylor came home from church to find her husband in his chair, lost in the writings of Bob Taylor with a shotgun across his lap. The third thing happened to Helen Robinson, Tom's widow. If Mr. Yule was as forgotten as Tom Robinson, Tom Robinson was as forgotten as Boo Radley. But Tom was not forgotten by his employer, Mr. Link Dears. Mr. Link Dears made a job for Helen. He didn't really, really need her, but he said he felt right bad about the way things turned out. I never knew who took care of her children while Helen was away. Calpurnia said it was hard on Helen because she had to walk nearly a mile out of her way to avoid the Ewells, who, according to Helen, chunked at her the first time she tried to use the public road. Mr. Link Dears eventually received the impression that Helen was coming to work each morning from the wrong direction and dragged the reason out of her. Oh, just let it be, Mr. Link, please, sir. The hell I will, said Mr. Link. He told her to come by his store that afternoon before she left. She did. And Mr. Link closed his store, put his hat firmly on his head and walked Helen home. He walked her the short way, by the Yules. On his way back, Mr. Link stopped at the crazy gate. Yule, I say, Yule. The windows, normally packed with children, were empty. I know every last one of you is in there or laying on the floor. Now hear me, Bob Yule. If I hear one more peep out of my girl Helen about not being able to walk this road, 
I'll have you in jail before sundown. Helen went to work next morning and used the public road. Nobody chunked at her. But when she was a few yards beyond the Yule house, she looked around and saw Mr. Yule walking behind her. She turned and walked on, and Mr. Yule kept the same distance behind her until she reached Mr. Link Dears's house. All the way to the house, Helen said. She heard a soft voice behind her, crooning foul words. Thoroughly frightened, she telephoned Mr. Link at his store, which was not too far from his house. As Mr. Link came out of his store, he saw Mr. Yule leaning on the fence. Don't you look at me, Link, dear, it's like I was dirt. I ain't jumped. Your first thing you can do, Yule, is get your stinking carcass off my property. You're leaning on it and I can't afford fresh paint for it. Second thing you can do is stay away from my cook or I'll have you up for assault. I ain't touched her, Link Dears, and ain't about to go with no black woman. You don't have to touch her. All you have to do is make her afraid, and if assault ain't enough to keep you locked up a while, I'll get you in on the lady's law. So get out of my sight. If you don't think I mean it, just bother that girl again. Well, Mr. Yule evidently thought he meant it for Helen reported no further trouble. I don't like it, Atticus, I don't like it at all, was Aunt Alexandra's assessment of these events. That man seems to have a permanent running grudge against everybody connected with that case. I know how that kind are about paying off grudges, but I don't understand why he should harbour one. He had his way in court, didn't he? Oh, I think I understand, said Atticus. It might be because he knows in his heart that very few people in Maycomb really believed his and Mayella's yarns. He thought he'd be a hero, but all he got for his pains was, was, okay, we'll convict this black man, but get back to your dump. He's had his fling with about everybody now, so he ought to be satisfied. He'll settle down when the weather changes. But why should he try to burgle John Taylor's house? He obviously didn't know John was home, or he wouldn't have tried. Only lights John shows on Sunday nights are on the front porch and back in his den. Well, you don't know if Bob Yule cut that screen. You don't know who did it, but I can guess. I proved him a liar, but John made him look like a fool. All the time Yule was on the stand, I couldn't dare look at John and keep a straight face. John looked at him as if he were a three-legged chicken or a square egg. Don't tell me judges don't try to prejudice juries. By the end of October, our lives had become the familiar routine of school, play, study. Aunt Alexandra was thriving. Miss Maudie must have silenced the whole missionary society at one blow, for Auntie again ruled that roost. Her refreshments grew even more delicious. Makem was itself again. Precisely the same as last year and the year before that, with only two minor changes. The second change in Maycomb since last year was not one of national significance. Until then, Halloween in Maycomb was a completely unorganised affair. Each child did what he wanted to do, with assistance from other children, if there was anything to be moved, or such as placing a light buggy on top of the livery stable. Next page near the bottom. The Maycomb ladies said things would be different this year. The high school auditorium would be open, there would be a pageant for the grown-ups, apple, apple bobbing, taffy pulling, pinning the tail on the donkey for the children. There would also be a prize of 25 cents for the best Halloween costume created by the wearer. Jem and I both groaned. Not that we'd ever done anything. It was the principle of the thing. Jem considered himself too old for Halloween. He said he wouldn't be caught anywhere near the high school at something like that. Oh, well, I thought Atticus would take me. I soon learned, however, that my services would be required on stage that evening. Mrs. Grace Merriweather had composed an original pageant entitled 
Maycomb County ad astra per aspera, and I was to be a ham. She thought it would be adorable if some of the children were costumed to represent the county's agricultural products. Cecil Jacobs would be dressed up to look like a cow, Agnes Boone would make a lovely butter bean, another child would be a peanut, and on down the line until Mrs. Merriweather's imagination and the supply of children were exhausted. Our only duties, as far as I could gather from our two rehearsals, were to enter from stage left as Mrs. Merriweather, not only the author, but the narrator, identified us. When she called out, Pork, that was my cue. Then the assembled company would sing, Maycomb County, Maycomb County, we will I be true to thee, as the grand finale, and Mrs. Merriweather would mount the stage with the state flag. My costume wasn't much of a problem. Mrs. Crenshaw, the local seamstress, had as much imagination as Mrs. Merriweather. Now please take note of the details of this costume. The way that this costume is constructed will become significant in the next chapter. Mrs. Crenshaw took some chicken wire and bent it into the shape of a cured ham. This she covered with brown cloth and painted it to resemble the original. I could duck under and someone would pull the contraption down over my head. It came almost to my knees. Mrs. Crenshaw thoughtfully left two peepholes for me. She did a fine job. Jem said I looked exactly like a ham with legs. There were several discomforts though. It was hot. It was a close fit. If my nose itched, I couldn't scratch. And once inside, I could not get out of it alone. When Halloween came, I assumed that the whole family would be present to watch me perform, but I was disappointed. Atticus said as tactfully as he could that he just didn't think he could stand a pageant tonight. He was all in. He had been in Montgomery for a week and had come home late that afternoon. He thought Jem might escort me if I asked him. Aunt Alexandra said she just had to get, get to bed early. She'd been decorating the stage all afternoon and was worn out. She stopped short in the middle of her sentence. She closed her mouth and opened it to say something, but no words came out. What's the matter, auntie? Oh, nothing, nothing. Well, somebody just walked over my grave. She put away from her whatever it was that gave her a pinprick of apprehension and suggested that I give the family a preview in the living room. So Jem squeezed me into my costume, stood at the living room door, called out, Pork! exactly as Mrs. Merriweather would have done, and I marched in. Atticus and Aunt Alexandra were delighted. I repeated my part for Calpurnia in the kitchen, and she said I was wonderful. I wanted to go across the street to show Miss Maudie, but James said she'd probably be at the pageant anyway. After that, it didn't matter whether they went or not. James said he'd take me. Thus began our longest journey together. Let's read about this longest journey, chapter 28, page 260. The weather was unusually warm for the last day of October. We didn't even need jackets. The wind was growing strong and James said it might be raining before we got home. There was no moon, a significant detail. The street light on the corner cast sharp shadows on the Radleys' house. I heard Jem laugh softly. I bet nobody bothers them tonight. It's a scary place though, ain't it? Boo doesn't mean anybody any harm, but I'm right glad you're along. You know Atticus wouldn't let you go to the schoolhouse by yourself. Oh, I don't see why. It's just around the corner and across the yard. That yard's a mighty long place for little girls to cross at night. Ain't you afraid of hints? We laughed. Hints, hot steams, incantations, secret signs had vanished with our years as mist with sunrise. What was that old thing? Angel bright, life in death, get off the road, don't suck my breath. Ah, oh, cut it out now. Boo mustn't be at home. Listen. 
High above us in the darkness, a solitary mocker poured out his repertoire in blissful unawareness of whose tree he sat in, plunging from the shrill key-key of the sunflower bird to the irascible quack of a blue jay to the sad lament of poor will, poor will, poor will. It's an important symbol, a mockingbird singing the night that Scout and Jem walk past the Radley house. We turned the corner and I tripped on a root growing in the road. Jem tried to help me, but all he did was drop my costume in the dust. I didn't fall, though, and soon we were on our way again. We turned off the road and entered the schoolyard. It was pitch black. How do you know where we're at, Jem? Well, I can tell we're under the big oak because we're passing through a cool spot. Careful now, don't fall again. The lights in the high school auditorium were blazing in the distance, but they blinded us, if anything. Don't look ahead, Scout. Look at the ground and you won't fall. Oh, you should have brought the flashlight, Jem. Oh, I didn't know it was this dark. It didn't look like it would be this dark early in the evening. So cloudy, that's why. Oh, it will hold off a while. So you've heard there's no moonlight and they don't have a torch. Someone leaped at us. God almighty, Jem yelled. A circle of light burst in our faces and Cecil Jacobs jumped in glee behind it. Ha, gotcha. Thought you'd be coming along this way. What are you doing way out here by yourself, boy? Aren't you scared of Boo Radley? Ah, oh, shucks, ain't much but around the corner. Who's scared to go around the corner? We had to admit that Cecil was pretty good, though. He had given us a fright and he could tell it all over the schoolhouse. That was his privilege. Say, ain't you a cow tonight? Where's your costume? Oh, it's up behind the stage. Mrs. Merriweather says the pageant ain't coming on for a while. You can put yours back of the stage by mine, Scott, and we can go with the rest of them. Oh, this was an excellent idea, Jem thought. He also thought it a good thing that Cecil and I would be together. This way, Jem would be left to go with people his own age. When we reached the auditorium, the whole town was there, except Atticus and the ladies worn out from decorating and the usual outcasts and shut-ins. Most of the county, it seemed, was there. The hall was teeming with slicked-up country people. The high school building had a wide downstairs hallway. People milled around booths that had been installed along each side. Oh, Jem, I forgot my money. Atticus didn't. Here's 30 cents. You can do six things. See you later on. Next page. We were about to purchase a blob of taffy when Mrs. Merriweather's runners appeared and told us to go backstage. It was time to get ready. The auditorium was filling with people. The Maycomb County High School band had assembled in front below the stage. The stage footlights were on and the red velvet curtain rippled and billowed from the scurrying going on behind it. Oh, somebody's mashed my costume, I wailed in dismay. Mrs. Merriweather galloped to me, reshaped the chicken wire, and thrust me inside. You all right in there, Scout? asked Cecil. You sound so far off, like you was on the other side of a hill. You don't sound any nearer. The band played the national anthem and we heard the audience rise. Then the bass drum sounded. Mrs. Merriweather, stationed behind her lectern beside the band, said, Maycomb County ad astra per aspera. The bass drum boomed again. That means, from the mud to the stars, a pageant. You reckon they wouldn't know what it was if she didn't tell them? The whole town knows it. But the country folks have come in. Be quiet back there, a man's voice ordered. And we were silent. The bass drum went boom with every sentence Mrs. Merriweather uttered. She chanted mournfully about Maycomb County being older than the state, that it was part of the Mississippi and Alabama territories, that the first white man to set foot in the virgin forests was the probate judge's great-grandfather five times removed, who was never heard of again. Then came the fearless Colonel Maycomb, for whom the county was named. Mrs. Merriweather gave a 30-minute description of Colonel Maycomb's exploits. I discovered 
that if I bent my knees, I could tuck them under my costume and more or less sit. I sat down, listened to Mrs. Merriweather's drone and the bass drum's boom and was soon fast asleep. They said later that Mrs. Merriweather was putting her all into the grand finale, that she had crooned pork with a confidence born of dine trees and butter beans entering on cue. She waited a few seconds, then called pork, and when nothing materialized, she yelled pork. I must have heard her in my sleep, or the band playing Dixie woke me. But it was when Mrs. Merriweather triumphantly mounted the stage with the state flag that I chose to make my entrance. Chose is incorrect. I thought I'd better catch up with the rest of them. They told me later that Judge Taylor went out behind the auditorium and stood there slapping his knees so hard Mrs. Taylor brought him a glass of water and one of his pills. Mrs. Merriweather seemed to have a hit. Everybody was cheering so. But she caught me backstage and told me I had ruined her pageant. She made me feel awful, but Jem came to fetch me. He was sympathetic. He said he couldn't see my costume much from where he was sitting. How he could tell I was feeling bad under my costume, I don't know. But he said I did all right. I just came in a little late, that was all. Jem was becoming almost as good as Atticus at making you feel right when things went wrong. Almost. Not even Jem could make me go through that crowd, and he consented to wait backstage with me until the audience left. A significant detail. The children are on their own. You want to take it off, Scott? No, I'll keep it on. You all want to ride home? No, sir, thank you. It's just a little walk. Be careful of hence. <laughs> Better still tell the hence to be careful of Scott. Oh, there aren't many folks left now. Let's go. We went through the auditorium to the hallway, then down the steps. It was still black dark. The remaining cars were parked on the other side of the building, and their headlights were little help. Well, if some of them were going in our direction, we could see better. Here, yes, Scott, let me hold on to your hock. You might lose your balance. I can see all right. Yeah, but you might lose your balance. You got me? Uh-huh. Jim, I forgot my shoes. They're back behind the stage. Oh, well, let's go get them. But as we turned around, the auditorium lights went off. You can get them tomorrow. But tomorrow's Sunday. Well, you can get the janitor to let you in. Janitor to let you in. Scout? Hmm? Nothing. Jim, you don't have... Hush a minute, Scout. Minutes up. What are you thinking about? I thought I heard something. Stop a minute. Hear anything? No. Jem, are you trying to scare me? You know I'm too... Be quiet. And I knew he wasn't joking. The night was still. I could hear his breath coming easily beside me. Occasionally there was a sudden breeze that hit my bare legs but it was all that remained of a promised windy night. This was the stillness before a thunderstorm. We listened. I heard an old dog just then. It's not that. I hear it when we are walking along, but when we stop, I don't hear it. Well, you hear my costume rustling. Ah, oh, it's just Halloween got you. I said it more to convince myself than Jem, for sure enough, as we began walking, I heard what he was talking about. It was not my costume. Oh, it's just old Cecil. He won't get us again. Let's don't let him think we're hurrying. We slowed to a crawl. I asked Jem how Cecil could follow us in this dark. Looked to me like he'd bumped into us from behind. Oh, I can see you, Scott. How? Oh, I can't see you. Your fat streaks are showing. Mrs. Crenshaw painted them with some of that shiny stuff so they'd show up under the footlights. I can see you pretty well, and I expect Cecil can see you well enough to keep his distance. I would show Cecil that we knew he was behind us and we were ready for him. Cecil Jacobs is a big wet hen. We stopped. 
there was no acknowledgement save Hen bouncing off the distant schoolhouse wall. I'll get him, said Jem. Hey! Hey, 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 answered the schoolhouse wall. It was unlike Cecil to hold out for so long. Once he pulled a joke, he'd repeat it time and time again. We should have been leapt at already. Jem signalled for me to stop again. Scott, can you take that thing off? I think so, but I ain't got anything on under it much. Well, I've got your dress here. I, I can't get it on in the dark. Okay, never mind. Jem, are you afraid? No, I think we're almost to the tree now. A few yards from that and we'll be to the road. We can see the street light then. You reckon we ought to sing, Jem? No. Be real quiet again, Scott. We had not increased our pace. Jem knew as well as I that it was difficult to walk fast without stumping a toe, tripping on stones and other inconveniences. And I was barefooted. Maybe it was the wind rustling the trees. But there wasn't any wind. And there weren't any trees except the big oak. Our company shuffled and dragged his feet, as if wearing heavy shoes. Whoever it was wore thick cotton pants. What I thought were trees rustling was the soft swish of cotton on cotton, weak, weak, with every step. I felt the sand go cold under my feet, and I knew we were near the big oak. Jem pressed my head. We stopped and listened. Shufflefoot had not stopped with us this time. His trousers swished softly and steadily. Then they stopped. He was running, running towards us with no child steps. Run, Scout! Run! Run! I took one giant step and found myself reeling. My arms useless in the dark, I could not keep my balance. Jem! Jem! Help me! Jem! Something crushed the chicken wire around me. Metal ripped on metal, and I fell to the ground and rolled as far as I could, floundering to escape my wire prison. From somewhere nearby came scuffling, kicking sounds, sounds of shoes and flesh scraping dirt and roots. Someone rolled against me and I felt a gem. He was up like lightning and pulled me with him, but though my head and shoulders were free, I was so entangled we didn't get very far. We were nearly to the road when I felt Jem's hand leave me, felt him jerk backwards to the ground, more scuffling, and there came a dull, crunching sound, and Jem screamed. I ran in the direction of Jem's scream and sank into a flabby male stomach. Its owner said, oof, and tried to catch my arms, but they were tightly pinioned. His stomach was soft, but his arms were like steel. He slowly squeezed the breath out of me. I could not move. Suddenly, he was jerked backwards and flung to the ground, almost carrying me with him. I thought, Jem's up. One's mind works very slowly at times. Stunned, I stood there dumbly. The scuffling noises were dying. Someone wheezed, and the night was still again. Still, but for a man breathing heavily, breathing heavily and staggering. I thought he went to the tree and leaned against it. He coughed violently, a sobbing, bone-shaking cough. Jem? Jem? Jem didn't answer. The man began moving around as if searching for something. I heard him groan and pull something heavy along the ground. It was slowly coming to me that there were now four people under the tree. Atticus? The man was walking heavily and unsteadily towards the road. 
I went to where I thought he had been and felt frantically along the ground, reaching out with my toes. Presently, I touched someone. Jem! My toes touched trousers, a belt buckle, buttons, something I could not identify, a collar and a face. A prickly stubble on the face told me it was not Jem's. I smelled stale whiskey. I made my way along in what I thought was the direction of the road. I was not sure because I'd been turned around so many times, but I found it and looked down to the street light. A man was passing under it. The man was walking with the staccato steps of someone carrying a load too heavy for him. He was going around the corner. He was carrying Jem. Jem's arm was dangling crazily in front of him. By the time I reached the corner, the man was crossing our front yard. Light from our front door framed Atticus for an instant. He ran down the steps and together, he and the man took Jem inside. I was at the front door when they were going down the hall. Aunt Alexandra was running to meet me. Call Dr. Reynolds. Atticus's voice came sharply from Jem's room. Where's Scott? Here she is. I'm all right, Auntie. You better call. Eula May, get Dr. Reynolds, quick. Agnes, is your father home? Oh, God, where is he? Please tell him to come over here as soon as he comes in. Please, it's urgent. Atticus came out of Jem's room. The moment Aunt Alexandra broke the connection, Atticus took the receiver from her. He rattled the hook and then said, Eula May, get me the sheriff, please. Heck, Atticus Finch, someone has been after my children. Jem's hurt. Between here and the schoolhouse, I can't leave my boy. Run out there for me, please, and see if he's still around. I doubt if you'll find him now, but I'd like to see him if you do. I've got to go now. Thanks, Heck. Atticus? Is Jem dead? No, Scott. Look after her sister. Aunt Alexandra's fingers trembled as she unwound the crushed fabric and wire from around me. Are you all right, darling? It was a relief to be out. My arms were beginning to tingle, and they were red with small hexagonal marks. I rubbed them, and they felt better. Auntie, is Jem dead? No. No, darling, he's unconscious. We won't know how badly he's hurt until Dr. Reynolds gets here. Jean Louise, what happened? I don't know. A car stopped in front of the house. I knew Dr. Reynolds' step almost as well as my father's. He came in the door and said, Good Lord, are you still standing? After ten forevers, Dr. Reynolds returned. Is Jem dead? Far from it. He's got a bump on the head, just like yours, and a broken arm. Scott, look that way. No, don't turn your head. Roll your eyes. Now look over yonder. He's got a bad break. So far as I can tell now, it's in the elbow. Like somebody tried to wring his arm off. Now look at me. Then he's not dead? No. We can't do much tonight except to try to make him as comfortable as we can. We'll have to x-ray his arm. It looks like he'll be wearing his arm way out by his side for a while. Don't worry, though. He'll be as good as new. Big boys, his age, bounce. You don't feel broke anyway, do you? You don't think he's dead then? No. I may be wrong, of course, but I think he's very alive. He shows all the symptoms of it. Go have a look at him, and when I come back, we'll get together and decide. Dr. Reynolds' step was young and brisk. Mr. Heck Tate's was not. His heavy boots punished the porch and he opened the door awkwardly. But he said the same thing Dr. Reynolds said when he came in. You all right, Scott? Yes, sir, I'm going in to see Jem. Atticus and them is in there. I'll go with you. Aunt Alexandra had shaded Jem's reading light with a towel and his room was dim. Jem was lying on his back. There was an ugly mark along one side of his face. His left arm lay out from his body. His elbow was bent slightly, but in the wrong direction. 
Jem was frowning. Jem, he can't hear you, Scott. He's out like a light. He was coming around, but Dr. Reynolds put him out again. Yes, sir. Jem's room was large and square. Aunt Alexandra was sitting in a rocking chair by the fireplace. The man who brought Jem in was standing in a corner, leaning against the wall. He was some countryman I did not know. He'd probably been at the pageant and was in the vicinity when it happened. He must have heard our screams and come running. Atticus was standing by Jem's bed. Come in, Heck. Did you find anything? I can't conceive of anyone low down enough to do a thing like this, but I hope you found him. Sit down, Mr. Finch. Well, let's all sit down. Have that chair. Heck, I'll get another one from the living room. Mr. Tate sat in Jem's desk chair. He waited until Atticus returned and settled himself. I wondered why Atticus had not brought a chair for the man in the corner, but Atticus knew the ways of country people far better than I. Some of his rural clients would park their long-eared steeds under the chinaberry trees in the backyard, and Atticus would often keep appointments on the back steps. This one was probably more comfortable where he was. Mr. Finch, said Mr. Tate, tell you what I found. I found a little girl's dress. It's out there in my car. Is that your dress, Scott? Yes, sir, if it's a pink one with smocking. I found some funny-looking pieces of muddy-coloured cloth. Oh, that's my costume, Mr. Tate. What is it, Heck? Bob Yule is lying on the ground under that tree down yonder with a kitchen knife stuck up under his ribs. He's dead, Mr. Finch. At last, the connection between the two sections of this novel become clear. Boo Radley and Tom Robinson, the two mockingbirds, bound together by the Finch family. We noted that the foreshadowing of the attack, Aunt Alexandra has a feeling that something bad was going to happen. Cecil Jacobs fakes an attack on the children as they walk towards the school and the adult warning that Scott and Jem need to be careful. Jem's injuries are severe and we don't hear from him again for the rest of this novel. His role is, to all intents and purposes, over. Bob Yule's character is so evil that there is no redemption here for him. He's dead, his true nature revealed. In novel convention, it's usual for a character who has caused the death of an innocent to meet with a violent end himself. I'm sure that there aren't too many of us who will shed a tear over Bob's demise. For the second last time, here are your review questions. As always, answer them in your notebooks and when you are finished, let me know so that I can email you the model answers. We have covered a lot of work this week. We have just one more lesson to go for the reading of the novel. Until then, make sure your work is up to date. See you soon.